Our Highline Voices, 106.5 KQWZ LP FM. Connecting Highline and our region. Share your story. Our Highline Voices, history, cultural heritage, art, performances, contemporary, pop culture. We are very motivated to provide a vibrant community museum and authentic social gathering place. It truly takes a village to raise a museum. Despite the challenges, our daily inspiration is our eagerness to build a stronger and more connected community. This museum is from the community to the community. Our passion is for our visitors to have access to a broad spectrum of information sources and cultural perspectives. Our Highline Voices. Hi everyone, this is Nancy from the Highline Heritage Museum and we are excited to welcome you and then welcome our guest today, um, Chris. He is going to be introducing himself, but it is something that uh, we presented his program not too long ago here at the museum. And for anyone who missed that program, you'll have a, an opportunity to actually get to see him and then hear more about what he does and who he is and just following that organic conversation that we hopefully you will be able to enjoy. So once again, thank you for joining us today. And this is a reminder that why are we doing this? Where are we sharing this? Is because our mission is to share the stories of the people in Halloween. And so this is another format of how we're doing it. It's not just through exhibits or collections or education or programming, but now through a radio station. So once again, thank you for joining us today. And Chris, I'm going to let you take over. Okay, wonderful. Well, Nancy, thank you so much for, for having me today. I'm, I'm honored to, to be here. This is a great opportunity to talk about healing, to talk about some different ways that we can heal. Um, I'm, a, I'm actually a big proponent of uh, the philosophy that we heal our communities by healing ourselves. Uh, we heal our world by healing ourselves. We first have to take responsibility for our own you know, pain and suffering and, um, uh, you know, whether it's mental, emotional, or, or physical illness, and we can empower ourselves to, to take care of ourselves in meaningful and effective ways. And in doing so, that then, you know, gives us more power to, to then carry that healing energy out into the communities around us. So, um, so again, my name is Chris Lemig. Uh, I'm the owner of True Nature Hypnotherapy. Uh, my office is in White Center. And really, basically, what I do is I help people to uh, release past tra trauma, uh, shame, and stress and anxiety uh, using hypnosis to help connect to our higher self or our higher mind. A very basic question. What's mm -hmm. healing? What does healing means to you? Uh, healing to me means transforming our our pain, our suffering, uh, into wholeness, into um, well being, into joy. So that might mean what you know we kind of traditionally think of as healing is like maybe getting better from an illness, but it doesn't necessarily have to be you know that cut and dry. Uh, transforming our energy and our thoughts and our feelings and emotions and our relationship to our pain, to our suffering can also be a form of healing. Because sometimes we're just, you know, we have, there's things that we just have to deal with and work through. Uh, but when we change our relationship to, to the suffering in our life, we actually start to heal on a deeper level, I think. There is, um, you know, we live in a culture where we just go, 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 go. And then right. we tend to just, you know, just get through the day and, and and push it through it. And then there are times that you are able to acknowledge pain. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're not have the opportunity because you're such in a go-go mode that doesn't mm -hmm. allow you to slow down and breathe in and then mm -hmm. really be conscious about, wait, I am tired. Wait, mm -hmm. I am hungry. Wait, I am sleepy. And your brain is operating and still in a, or in a work mode or, you know, I got a teenager and I got a house and I got all the issues. And so it's like my brain is telling me one thing and then my body is telling me completely different. Sometimes I don't see the alignment mm -hmm. on my brain with my, or my mind with my body mm -hmm. or even with my heart and my spirit. Um, mm -hmm. And so when, when you say healing is uh, a physical healing, mm -hmm. but then combine it with mental 
in the spiritual i guess yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah um you know there's a perspective in a lot of uh eastern healing traditions and philosophical traditions that you know our um all of our illness in our body begins in our mind and now we got to be careful in our from our perspective over here to to misinterpret that uh as to meaning like oh i'm just making this up in my mind it's it's not about that it's that our mind is actually the essence of who we are it's not our bodies our bodies are actually uh, connected to our minds but there's a mind body connection and our mind our our essence is the most important part of our being so when our minds become ill become imbalanced uh, when we become too absorbed in fear and shame and guilt and you know traumatic feelings and uh, unworthiness and things like that that's going to start manifesting in our bodies right because there is this deep connection between the mind and the body a great example of this is you can just do a simple exercise you can you know, imagine, for example, that you are going into your kitchen and going into your refrigerator or wherever you keep, you know, your your fresh fruits and vegetables. And just imagine that you go into that uh, that drawer, that you know, drawer in your refrigerator, and you pull out a nice big fresh lemon, right? And you take that lemon and just imagine it. Imagine that lemon in your hand. Feel the coolness. Feel the texture of the rind. And go ahead and imagine taking a knife and cutting the lemon open and just smelling the wonderful smell of the lemon zest and then cutting a nice wedge imagine putting it up to your mouth taking that wedge and putting it up to your mouth and then taking a big bite as all that lemon juice like sprays into your mouth and and just that wonderful tart tanginess right now most people when we do this exercise will start to salivate i'm starting to salivate right now just thinking about it now i don't know if everyone can see but there's no lemon in my hand right there's no lemon here I'm just thinking it. I'm imagining it. So this is just one example of how we can begin to realize that our thoughts, our mind is very powerful. It has a direct connection to our body and affects us, uh, affects us on a physical level. The idea of that connection, um, I was sharing earlier with another person, the alignment of mind and body and in the spirit of, of heart and 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 it's almost like it was a concept that is not reachable something that you know is that truly sustainable is really something that we can train ourselves to do there or it's almost like climbing to a spot of mm -hmm. like climbing the mount everett you know like mm -hmm. it is a, a really long goal to do and then even if we reach it how long can we stay on top of the mountain how long can we actually retain that mm -hmm. and um the my interpretation instead of seeing it as a mountain a place that you go in and then you don't really spend so much time on it it's more of a glimpses in your day glimpses of um like a habit that you have um mm -hmm. talking about the efforts and we can go back to my one of the questions i got for you is i read that you were uh also had written books and that you have uh, have been teaching how to meditate and then on top of it that you were a former um buddhist monk that's, that's right. a, that that was surprising when i was yeah. like oh okay this is yeah. this is this is cool um yeah. Yeah. how is that implemented into your everyday life how um the hypnosis in in the healing process it is do you think it's something that you cultivate through time that you climb mm -hmm. the mountain you reach out there, but then it's no sustainable. Or do you think it is something that you implement in your everyday life, like uh, brushing your teeth or, mm -hmm. or, or washing the dishes or, mm -hmm. you know, something, take a shower, something that you do to take care of yourself? How yeah. do you see your practice being implemented in your everyday life? Right, right. Yes to all of the above. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think um, in maybe in typical sort of uh cohen uh mysterious mystical buddhist fashion i might say that you know we're actually we're already on the mountain we're already on the top of the mountain all the time so we are already uh just our true self right we're just temporarily have uh been uh, i guess distracted 
distracted by the minutia of our lives. So we're distracted by our experiences. We're distracted by our past history. We're distracted by our beliefs and what we think is possible and not possible. We're distracted by the responsibilities that we have and the problems and challenges that we face. But the truth is, is that our mind, that clear mind that is at the top of the mountain, that's who, that's always there. So, so how do we remember that? How do we recognize that? Well, now we start to talk about the methods, right? Which is like the everyday practice. We have to practice getting back there time and time again. So it is becomes like um, something like you know, you know, taking care of yourself, washing your body. Um, in the same way that we take care of our bodies, we want to start taking care of our minds. So one way to do this is just to simply start to cultivate and practice being aware of where we are right now in this moment to start to become aware of how we're feeling in our body to become aware of what emotions we're experiencing what's the quality of our thoughts so this does take some practice i'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie i'm sorry to break it to you <laughs> But it's going to take some a little bit of effort to make that shift because normally we're in sleepwalk mode. Normally we're in basically a hypnotic trance where we're not really clear, we're not really awake, we're not aware. We're just kind of in this tunnel, this tunnel vision of this is what I'm going to do and this is who I am and this is what I need to do. And we forget that there's this open spaciousness of our mind that's always there and always present. So we have to do a little bit of work on it. But once we do, it starts to become a habit. And it starts to become uh, easier and easier to start to catch yourself and wake yourself up. How long have you been practicing um, this this way of healing? Um, so I have been, uh, you know, kind of doing a lot of mindfulness and meditation. Uh, you know, I took you know took ordination as a Buddhist monk uh, back in 2014. I did that for a couple of years. Uh, before that, there was a whole lot of preparation going up to that. Um, so the the mindfulness aspect and kind of just just working with the emotions and working with the mind body connection has been something that I've been uh, working with since 2007. Um, uh, and then hypnosis is something that I stumbled across uh, very fortuitously uh, in 2018 or so, 2019, uh, in which I kind of start started my practice at that time. Pain. We were talking mm -hmm. about healing. Now mm -hmm. we're going to mm -hmm. go back to pain. Right, right. Um, there's obviously mental, mm -hmm. physical, mm -hmm. spiritual pain. Right. And this is a very interesting topic to me personally. And I think to all of us, all of us, we are humans and we all experience pain and joy and, and, and healing and despair and tiredness and other different aspects of, of our humanity. Mm -hmm. But pain is such an interesting thing because um, we all have different personalities. We all cope with pain differently. We, some of them will like to blame the pain to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Somebody will like to hide the pain and don't pretend it doesn't exist at all. Some of us will like to get depressed and, and, and then feel the pain way too much and to the point where uh, the self-blame and, and all that takes place. And some of them will just see it as a, I don't know, like it's no a real thing. It is all in your mind. You control everything in your mind. Your mind is more powerful, so the pain is not there. And you're trying to convince yourself that the pain is not real. Mm -hmm. And so I know that we all have different personalities. We all cope with pain differently. Is your mythology the same? Is it applicable to everyone in the same way? Or do you customize? Or well, there's there's a different ways to handle pain, depending on the person, personalities, and issues. Um, or it's just one, one umbrella that covers mm -hmm. the same process for everyone. Yeah. I, you know, I think that there's general, you know, kind of principles that we that I that I use with people, um, but everybody is different, right? We're all different. We're all going to come to our healing in our own way, and that's something that we need to acknowledge probably from the beginning of our journey, or at least at some point in our journey, to know that hey, you know what? The way that I'm going to heal is going to be different from somebody else. It's not going to look exactly the same way. It's not going to you know the the same methods maybe aren't going to be applicable to me that they are to other people. So recognizing that there is a personal element to it. But the approach that I take with everyone that I'm working with, whatever pain that they're 
wanting to resolve or or heal from, whether it's psychic pain, spiritual, you know, uh, physical, uh, is is really really um, coming to from the perspective that you know we're all perfectly okay and good and worthy and valuable and pure from the very beginning, just from the very beginning of, of the essence of who we are. So when we're experiencing things like physical pain, for example, uh, or emotional pain, that we have a tendency based on maybe deep sense senses of unworthiness and, and shame to feel like this is a reflection of me, right? This pain is proof that I'm not okay, that there's something wrong with me, that I'm broken, that I'm weak, that uh, that you know I'm being punished for something, right? So so that's the first thing that we try to clear out. We try to clear out that that shame, that unworthiness, that that misconception that there's something wrong with you, that we're broken because nobody is broken. We're all, you know, I don't want to get too too like spiritual and woo woo here, but we're all divine beings in a way. We're all divine expressions of 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 this perfectly pure uh, consciousness and awareness. So um, recognizing that more and more, we, then we start to approach our pain from a new perspective, from a perspective of this is just an experience that I'm having. It doesn't have anything to do with my value or with my worth uh, or with my basic goodness. It's just simply an experience. So now we can start to bring a sense of curiosity to it. We can start to bring a sense of wonder to it. Like I wonder then what, how I can start to relate to this pain in a different way. So rather than resisting it, right? Rather than trying to get rid of it, right? Rather than trying to fix it, because all that's going to do is just make us clamp down even further. And as we know, as we clamp down further, it hurts more, right? We can start to be open and we can start to just simply observe and to simply behold and to simply say, you know what? This is just another expression of my human experience. What can I learn from this? What can I receive from this? And it may be that pain is just something that you're going to have to learn how to navigate and integrate into your life. But I have seen time and time again, when we start to open up like that, just by the nature of just letting go, the pain starts to dissipate, the pain starts to lessen, the pain starts to become more manageable, right? When we look at a thing without our ideas about it, and we start to just see it for what it is, it starts to lose some of that energy, that, that negative energy that we build up in our minds about it. You know, the reaction of like, oh, I'm starting to feel pain. So we tense up and they're like, no, I don't want to feel pain. And the more you start thinking that, the worse it gets. But when you just relax and just experience it, and start to let go and start to breathe it may still be there but it's going to be you're going to notice that it's different that it's changing that it's not always one thing it's not it's permanent right there's a there's a evolving quality to it so um yeah so so that's what i what some of my thoughts about that yeah there's uh all kinds of pains too it's not just the same pain you know like mm -hmm. you just mm -hmm. say that um there's some pains that are physical that will always be there and you will always have to cope with it. Mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, I have a brain tumor and so my headaches, it just drives me crazy every day. I mean, I I, right. I don't want to cultivate that term, but there are moments that I, I want to hate it because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying yeah. to fight through it. Right. Um, right. And like you said, you just, just let it go and mm -hmm. experience that. But mm -hmm. what happens when it's every day for many hours and you don't get mm -hmm. a break out of it? Um Right. Another one is the reality of just being in in, in coexisting with 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 our reality of everything is around us. Mm -hmm. um, bad things happen, and in pain of that, how do you cope with that? And mm -hmm. and you you talk about experience, but experiences is what happens when you add one plus one plus one plus one, and then you get pain. Mm -hmm. different shapes and forms of pain on the same day in the same time mm -hmm. and so how do you cope with that um experience of just letting go and and, and process it and mm -hmm. um it's an interesting topic and i like i said i, I everyone reacts differently mm -hmm. i just been to um that i've been going through therapy for three years and when i went there i had my mind that i went there for a very specific reason as I continue to go through this process, I realize that I have a really bad trauma. 
Mm -hmm. I didn't realize I had a, a trauma, a, a serious trauma in me. And and the more I'm exploring that, the more it's hurting. And the mm -hmm. more it's like almost felt like I wish I know that I had this. I wish I was more naive in this. And it just, you know, and I don't know. I, I don't, I, I, part of me wants to fly, wants to run away. I don't, I don't want to continue um, experiencing. The more I'm into this, the more, it's getting harder to to breathe and it's harder to to realize how bad it's been. <laughs> right. And then on top of the physical, on top of everyday life and on top of, you know, um, issues that happens. And so going back to your, uh, to you and, and the way you handle your patients and your practice. Mm -hmm. And so how long does it take for you? I mean, how is the format? What is it that you provide? What type of services are you providing to your clients? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, right now, I'm still doing a lot of one-to-one -one work with people. So uh, these are individual sessions where we get together for an hour a session. And, uh, you know, I usually work with people uh, in, in the realm of between three and five or six sessions or so. And we really laser focus on specific issues. And we're really... Uh, using hypnosis, which is really just using is a form of using our imagination to create change within our bodies, within our minds, and with our emotional state, uh, creating deep subconscious psychological and spiritual changes and shifts within ourselves so that we can start to train ourselves and to teach ourselves at a subconscious biological level how to relate to our, our pain or our problems in a new way, in a different way. Uh, and, and again, operating from this new paradigm, this new view that you are perfectly okay, just as you are, and that your experience, no matter how challenging and difficult, is your experience and an expression of your pure being, an expression of your purity, then we can start to, again, relate to those problems in a new way and to start to see solutions in a new way. Um, in, the, in the case of trauma, a lot of times um, what we're doing is we're just recognizing that our trauma, which is, you know, experiences from the past that were so, uh, you know, maybe terrifying or painful or, you know, shaming or whatever it might be or harmful, um, what happened was, is that our nervous system, our bodies kind of absorbed the shock, the psychic shock of that experience. And then our nervous systems got wired to respond to that. in the only way that we knew, which was like, you know, defensiveness or, you know, fear or run away or whatever it is. And we've just held that in our bodies, right? So it's right learning how to retrain our subconscious mind and our nervous system to recognize that that is over that's done that's no longer a concern that happened in the past and now we start to remind the body that you're in the present now and you're okay now you're actually safe right so the trauma is over it's in the past and one of the ways that we can do that is by first of all consciously remembering that but in a state of hypnosis which is just a state of open uh, receptivity and new ideas we start to send love back to that younger version of ourselves that experienced the original trauma and we start to send back our resources our adult wisdom our um our compassion our wisdom our strength back to that previous version of ourselves in our imagination and i see it time and time again transform that trauma into again it's just something that happened in the past and you're sending that love back to that person and you're letting them know over and over and over again, you're okay. I've got you. You survived. You made it. You know, that's over. It's done. It's not happening anymore. You're okay right now. And so stepping into that then in, and imagining going into your future now with uh, new resources and a new sense of resilience um, is basically how we work through, through trauma. And I'm more curious a little bit more about the connection of the mind and body. And um, I always felt that when I've been crying too much, I get a cold right after that. Mm. Um, you get what? A cold, like I get a, a, cold. a oh, it okay. just mm. blowing my nose and coughing mm. and it just, mm. I felt, I feel like my immune system is low and down. Um, 
And so, so the, how do you relate to mind and emotions? I mean, it is a very intriguing mm -hmm. topic to to me, and I hope to a lot more people that what is the connection? What is that? You know, of that triangle: mind, body, and 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 soul, and the spirit, and and your heart. Mm -hmm. And that relationship that exists. Um, one thing is that I have tell my daughter is like one thing is what you're thinking, something completely different. What you're saying is something completely different. What you're doing, mm -hmm. and so it is possible that you even with that very simple action, you are not aligning. You know, like you may say, "Well, I'm really, 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 really tired," but I'm saying that I'm okay, and then um, I'm doing more work instead of resting. It's just an right. example of okay. how we are not cohesive even within ourselves and okay. how we, what we think, what we say, what we do. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. and then how we do deny, uh, healing and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and processing things. Mm -hmm. Um, would you practice? Um, so do you have the number of sessions you talk directly to that person? Mm -hmm. Um, it is something that you also encourage, like a diet or, or, or changes of routine, or it is all just through the sessions that you find a healing. So all of those, you know, specifics again are going to be very personal, and some of those things I'm not a specialist in, so I'm I'm not going to give anybody nutrition advice or things like that. And to tell you the truth, I'm not really interested in giving people specific advice about what to do. For themselves. The main thing that I do is, and you brought up a very interesting point here, this disconnection between um, how our bodies are feeling, for example, uh, and then what we're saying about our real, our true experience, and then what we're actually doing, right? So there's this, mm -hmm. dis, this, uh, this dissonance, right, between all of that. And so my practice is called true nature hypnotherapy. And I think I mentioned the, the higher self or the higher mind aspect, which is crucial to the work that, that I do with people. And in hypnosis, really the main thing that I do is to help people to connect with that higher self, that, that highest, most wise part of your being that knows exactly what's right for you. Right. So we first have to come to just an acceptance that there is such a thing that that is possible. That there is a part of you that loves you and that cares for you and that has this vantage point, this view of your life that really knows everything about you and knows exactly what's going to be right for you and the most beneficial for you. And when we start to connect with that part of ourselves, with that, that loving intelligence, that healing power of our being, that wisdom, we start to be able to see more clearly what it is that we're really supposed to be doing. And so you're able to then become your own healer and your own guide. And you're able to start to trust yourself, right? I'll give you an example without spilling any names or giving too many details. But I was working with somebody, and actually, this is quite common. People will come to me asking, uh, I want to figure out my purpose in life. You know, I'm getting to a certain age, and I just feel like I just I haven't figured it out. I don't know what my purpose is, and I need to figure it out. And there's usually an edge of desperation to that, right? Mm -hmm. There's usually this like, I need to figure out my purpose. Oh my gosh, what am I doing with my life? I'm wasting my life. And and I just kind of nod and I smile and I say, okay, well, let's let's start. Let's do some sessions, and we'll do the first and maybe the second session. And at the latest, by the third session, we'll really open up that channel open up that channel to your higher self. And that higher self light and wisdom and love comes through. And I've seen it time and time again, where that higher self says to the person, just relax. You're doing great. You're doing just fine. You're exactly where you need to be. And here's what's here. And then, and then we can go into more detail. And here's what you can really do to enrich your life even further. And I just turn it over to the person at that point and they figure it out themselves. Right. And that goes for any issue, any issue that we're dealing with. That's all I'm doing is introducing people to that healer, that inner guide, that inner wisdom, that inner light that's always there. And from there, then you, you take it from there. And then, yes, there are practices that we can do to continue to cultivate that relationship and to just make sure that we're keeping that connection fresh day by day. But really, it's really, I turn it over to them. And the tra it's transformative. It's transformative. Yeah. Um, 
How long can you be without that connection? Maybe there's no a, a fair mm -hmm. question at all, but mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. once you've reached the level of connection with your higher self, mm -hmm. um, what's, okay, I, I guess I'll ask at a different angle. Uh, mm -hmm. In one day, I can experience many emotions. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have the capacity to retain one emotion for too long. Mm -hmm. If I'm mad, absolutely crazy mad at my daughter because something that she did, mm -hmm. I would be explosive mad for a long time. When, mm -hmm. when I mean a long time, like one or two hours. But after that, I'm starting to calm down. I started mm -hmm. to process. I'm saying, okay, mm -hmm. she made a mistake. Mm -hmm. How uh, how am I going to be part of a solution? Is a part of the problem? And then I start thinking of that process. Even when I'm mad, I'm not able to retain that emotion for too long. Mm -hmm. um, the same when I'm too happy. Mm -hmm. The same when I'm too joyful. The same when I'm calm and relaxed. Mm -hmm. Is um, we are a living or can or we are living bodies that experiencing mm -hmm. all these emotions in a constantly mm -hmm. in a in a constant flow of life. Uh, mm -hmm. So when you talk about healing. What does that healing means in, in it, when it comes to time frame? And it's something that mm -hmm. you can measure it by how many times you relax in a day? Mm -hmm. Or can you measure it by the quality of your life in the long term? Mm -hmm. Can you measure it by the um, the breaking the pattern and the habits of the person hurting themselves by, you know, if you talking gently and have that self-compassion and self-respect and self-worth and self-love, before that, it was safe hate and self blame and guilt and that. And so those are very powerful emotions. And mm -hmm. so how long can you keep it? Or what is the sign of actually being healthy? Mm -hmm. right. When you experience so many things in one day, you can never retain one emotion for too long. Right, right. So um, again, I bring up really, really important uh, points there about that experience of going through almost as if we're totally powerless and helpless and we're just experiencing one emotion after another and it's just there's nothing we can do about it because it's just one emotion after another and it's high and then it's low and then it's high and then it's low and then we're joyful and then we're angry and then we're happy and then we're totally disappointed and crestfallen <laughs> right we have to start to cultivate uh, we have to start to learn how our body and our mind are interacting. And we have to start to learn, again, that it's the thoughts, it's the mind that is influencing the body first. First, if you have a happy thought, even if you're not consciously, if you just randomly have a happy thought, right, happy memory, that thought then it communicates to your brain, I'm happy. This is happy. This feels good. So your brain says, great. Well, let's go ahead and start to create then the, the proper chemicals in your body that correspond to that happy emotion. So then it just sends information, electrical signals to the different glands that create, you know, serotonin and, you know, all these happiness chemicals. And then you feel happy, right? And then your body feels good. So your body feels happy. And then that happiness in your body then, you know, generates another happy thought, right? And now it's known, scientists, have, neuroscientists have shown that the, the, the lifetime of a chemical emotion is about 90 seconds or so, right? So as those chemicals move through your body, they're going to dissipate and that emotion is then going to, you know, dissipate, disappear, and it's going to be, become something else unless you feed it with another thought, right? And then you have a feedback loop. So happy thought, happy brain, happy chemicals, happy body, happy thought, happy brain, happy chemicals, happy body, and so on and so forth, right? Now, normally we're not in control of that. And of course, the opposite is true with, with negative emotions, right? Angry thought, angry brain, angry chemicals, you know, uh, cortisol and adrenaline and fight flight, and then the body then communicates then to the mind again that we're angry. Yep, we're angry. That's right. She did say something that really made me angry. And yes, you're right. That was a terrible thing. And yes, she did offend me deeply at a personal level, whatever it is, right? So then it becomes a feedback loop, okay? 
Now, the thing that we have to understand is that we have the, the capacity and the ability and the power to change our thoughts. You can change your thoughts anytime you want. There's nothing, there's no law that says that once you have one thought, one type of thought, you have to have another thought like that. You can catch yourself when you notice that you're having an angry thought and say, wait a minute. No, I don't want that. That doesn't feel good. And you know what? It doesn't really solve the problem anyway. So let me have a loving thought instead. Let me have a loving thought towards this person. And let me try to see things from maybe from their point of view, or let me see the situation from a different perspective. And let me start to try to relate to this situation in a different way. And maybe maybe that person is objectively wrong or you need to keep them away or whatever you need to do. But nonetheless, you don't have to be angry about it. You don't have to be caught up in that negative emotion, which causes all the health problems in our bodies, right? Happy thoughts promote health and harmony. Negative, angry, shame-based, fear thoughts, they create stress and cortisols and illness and disease. So to answer your question about how do we then measure, we measure by how much we're able to choose our thoughts, choose our emotional state, and just get better and better and better at that, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, to, to me, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that people might interpret things differently. I, I'm learning this as I continue to to grow that mm -hmm. one basic term can be, the, the, tr the translation of that term can be different for a lot of people. And mm -hmm. so it is very interesting to do that. What about dealing with teenagers? I got mm -hmm. my little monster. I love my yeah. little monster. She's right. beautiful. But oh my goodness, she, right. Right. I feel like that's a uh, cartoon characters, um, monster Disney movie that is right. like, so cute and adorable, but still a little monster. And so yeah. right. how is your relationship on this practice with teenagers? So I don't specialize working with teenagers or kids, but I have, and I and I do from time to time. And what I've found is that actually, you know, I, I said before that hypnosis is a lot about using our imagination to create change for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And boy, teenagers and you know, young people and 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 children, their imaginations are already on fire, right? They're just uh, they're just limitless. They're unbound. As we become adults you know, we start to become more fixed and rigid in our ideas. So we, you know, for example, somebody might come in and say like, you can't hypnotize me. And they've got this idea that they've built up over 25, 30 years or whatever. And so they've got that, that I need to work with, right? Well, kids are not like that. Kids are just willing to play. They're willing to experiment. They're more open. So when we're doing hypnosis with kids, there's, there's the, the, the door is wider. The door is already open. So I can start to then direct their imagination towards different possibilities and different outcomes. And that's really, again, a, another foundational aspect of what I do with people. Most of the time we get these blinders on and we think there's only one way. There's only one solution, and that is to get angry, or that is to get anxious, or that is to be limited in some way, right? So we're just, we have this, nope, that's just how it is, and that's who I am, and because I experienced this, I can't do this this way, right? So we have these, these uh, neurological pathways that get built up. And what we do in hypnosis is we say like, no, wait a minute, open it up. How many different possibilities is there? How many different choices do you have? How many different ways and solutions are there out there? There's literally limitless possibilities. So when working with kids, they're already halfway there, right? So it's just really about like, now let's direct this in a, in a different way. And it's also about like, you know, you know, parents and kids, they've got it, they're close, right? So sometimes it's hard, it's hard to pull away and to, and to, you know, give each other the grace, right? It's, it's, it can be difficult. I know. I mean, I, I, I'm a son, <laughs> <laughs> I've had, I had parents, you know, uh, and we, we, you know, we had those relationships and those struggles and it's, you know, you're just, you're really, you're too close. So, you know, when you're talking, when a kid is going to a, a good therapist, um, they might be able to open up in different ways. They might be able to express things in different ways and then thereby see things in different ways. Yeah. Our time is almost gone. That was okay. super fast, but um, wow. I wanted to to thank you for allowing us to to get a little bit more to be more informed more educated as to the practice that you do and and 
to really start processing the concept that everything is intertwined, everything is interconnected, our mind, our body, or on the essence of who we are, and that we have work to do internally, and then we have to do extra work externally. And so there's two different kinds of battles that we, we're dealing with. And the idea that um, it's not just about healing because of genetics or environmental conditions or, you know, it's also about adding, doing the math, doing one plus one plus one plus one outside, I mean, externally and internally. Mm -hmm. And so it's been fascinating to 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 get to know a little bit more about the work that you do and, okay. and how you do the work. And um, part of me is excited to know that we do have that control somehow internally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the other part of me is I've been nervous and, uh, and anxious as I know that um, there are times that if you really want to um, deal or cope, you have to actually confront a situation that you mm -hmm. might not be wanting to confront it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to me, it's like I, I pretend I close my eyes and the monster is not there. You know, like I just hide my face from the, mm -hmm. hide yeah. my face with a blanket. I'm like, no, the monster is not there. But mm -hmm. there are moments that if we really want to heal, it's, you have to pick it down and and then do the work of actually addressing that. Right. Any last comments or feedback that you would like to add before we be close? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think it's just uh, important to remember that no matter what, uh, up until this very moment, we've survived everything. We've survived it all. And we've faced it all at one point or another. And we've gotten through every single challenge. And that's proven by the fact that we're here, we're breathing, and we're alive. And this journey of healing can be, it doesn't have to be a, a task. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, strenuous. Uh, we can be diligent, and we can work hard, but it can also be a joy. It can be a joyful path, a joyful journey, and an adventure discovering new possibilities about ourselves. Yeah. Um, yeah, we all have different defense mechanisms and we react differently to situations and uh, I admire the work that you do and, and be able to navigate the different waters from different people and, and just trying to find the right uh, angle to mm -hmm. to do it with compassion and kindness and care and so thank you for that humanity component of you for allowing us to witness how you care for other people because I'm sure it's draining to you meaning in a way that you are there helping people but then you're also human you're receiving all that you also and so somehow you have to filter that out you don't feel that you don't feel that you have to I don't I don't you don't um I believe in energies and so yeah. you don't yeah. feel that um by let's just say you're hugging a kid who is crying too mm -hmm. much yeah. And you are protecting it. You are uh, just you mm -hmm. right there, and, and you are feeding it a kid, and then you're trying to really take care of it. Mm -hmm. One way or another, you get exhausted too because you're human. You're also mm -hmm. feeling that, even though that pain is not directly at you, but you're right there helping the person go through that. That person right. is not alone going through that. You're also in the journey because you're right there hugging that person. Right. So that's what I meant. That is not that is draining you emotionally physically or more emotionally it's more about the you're still a human and you're still going through that journey with this other person and so that's what i meant yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much once again for for joining us today and for letting us to have a little glimpse of the work that you do and once again thank you thank you for, thank you. for everything thank you so much nancy this has been an absolute pleasure it's been a wonderful conversation thanks thank you Our Highline Voices, 106.5 KQWZ LP FM. We envision ourselves sitting at a round table where no one is the leader and stories are heard respectfully, regardless of gender, age, sexual orientation, disabilities, or ethnicity. We want to embrace our differences and similarities. We are creating a place where visitors can connect with the stories and each other. Our mission is, we collect, preserve, and tell the stories of the Highline region and its people. 
We want to extend our mission outside the walls of the museum. Our Highline Voices represents us all, honoring our past, celebrating our present, and uniting to cultivate our future. This project allows us to reach out to demographics who might be unable to visit the museum. People with disabilities, low-income families, people who don't trust museums, and more. In partnership, we are launching a locally programmed new radio station at the museum, featuring recorded and live Highline's heritage, history, culture, arts, and more. Are you interested in sharing your story? Email director at highlinemuseum.org.